how do we as people of faith peacefully coexist? So I'll start by sharing a quote from the Baha'i Writings that says, The religion of God is for love and unity. Make it not the cause of enmity and dissension. So as soon as we start arguing, we lose the point of the religion of God, which is supposed to be love. So if we can keep that in mind as we, we coexist, and then we can serve together, we can pray together, we can appreciate our differences and find our similarities and, um, and, and really help carry forward an ever-advancing civilization. Because un until we learn to see ourselves as one, we just keep keeping all of ourselves back. So the African Women of Faith Network is an interfaith body where we have Muslim, Hindu, Baha'i, uh, Christian, Jewish represent representatives, all the major faith groups in Africa. Um, and we also have national interfaith networks of women and citywide um, ones like the Women of Interfaith Women of Mombasa. So um, in South Africa, we're just starting out the African Women of Faith Network. But because we work, a, women's na nature is to serve. Women's nature is to communicate and, and be compassionate. And as women of different faiths, we can very easily do that together. It's our nature. And it's really a beautiful phenomenon. So it's a really an honor to, to work with the diverse women. Uh, the African Women of Faith Network is a... Uh, <coughs> It's an organization that uh, came about as a result of the work of the African Council of Leaders, the African Council of uh, Leaders and the Religions for Peace. Uh, apart from the African Women of Faith Network, there are also youth networks uh, attached to the African Women of, I mean, African Council of, uh, Council of Religious Leaders and the country level interreligious councils. So, for instance, in Nigeria, we have Naira, which is the Nigerian Interreligious <laughs> Council. Uh, the Nigerian Women of Faith Network is part of NIREC. And this is what obtains in all the countries of Africa. If the need for an African uh, Women of Faith Network arose as a result uh, of the realities of our situation in our different countries. First, it's premised on the fact that women wield a lot of influence uh, at several levels, starting from the family level to the community level. And even where you find uh, women that, that are not very educated, you know, they still have some relevance uh, in their countries. Uh, two, women faith leaders have acceptability everywhere. And because they have been involved in doing a lot of work, there was a need to bring them, to bring their work to the fore and to, to further build these networks so that uh, the network serves as a learning platform, as a platform for the exchange of ideas, experiences, sharing lessons learned from our different works that we do in our countries. So the network from the uh, little clip that you saw, the short clip that you saw uh, from just a few countries, the network has done a lot uh, of work in the area of uh, gender equity, uh, promoting peaceful coexistence, uh, working with government to influence policies, favorable policies that could uh, advance the cause of women and girls, participating in uh, 
law drafting, drafting of bills that go into uh, the legislature in our different countries, and also uh, serving uh, as a source of um, solace to people who are displaced or people who need help through their humanitarian services. We cannot um, exhaust the list of uh, our areas of um, uh, interventions, uh, but we do know from the reports uh, from different countries that the focus has been mainly on socio-economic development uh, programs for women and girls. Uh, I don't know, Haley, would you want to say a little bit more about the women of faith or Nagiba? Thank you so much. I was just actually speaking with Nagiba earlier about the essentiality of this network because in the interfaith space, which we know is so important, it's still very dominated by religious leaders um, that are mainly men. And in order to create balance, we need to make sure that the women's voices are alongside our male counterparts. Um, I was looking at this quote from the Baha'i writings that I just felt was so relevant in our, in our vision building uh, as women of faith. And it says that um, uh, in the revelation of Baha'u'llah, the women go neck and neck with the men. In no movement will they be left behind. Their rights with men are equal in degree. They will enter all administrative branches of politics. They will attain in all such a degree as will be considered the very highest station of the world of humanity and will take part in all affairs. So, Rasi Ashok, do you not look upon the present conditions? In not, not far distant future, the world of women will become all effulgent and all glorious. So, I share that because we're building a vision right now of a, of a world where the voices of men and women are the side by side equally. And when we are able to do that, and as the women that we're sharing in the video clip shared as well, when all we're asking is, is to walk us alongside us. Because when we are able to do that, then what ends up happening is that children are protected. Because if our voices are heard and, and the policy is, is created around what women know is best for children, children will be protected. And um, that's just one example. But I think as we are building our vision for a future, we need to keep in mind that um, there's another quote in the Baha'i writings that um, until, um, I'm paraphrasing, but until women's uh, capacity is fully realized, men still, they also cannot attain the greatness that can be theirs. So all of us are held back. So we as women of faith, we invite our, our, our male counterparts to walk alongside us so that your capacity can also increase. And with that increased capacity of both the male and the female genders, um, we create balanced societies, we will end war, we will end hardship, and we will all be healthier. So uh, we are here today in this beautiful balance of male and female in the room. And we invite you to walk that journey with us and build that vision um, with the women of faith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haley and, uh, and Halima. Um, we are going to get to talk more about it, but I'd, I'd like us to move to uh, the next uh, issue. But what came out, uh, even as we were engaging in this, uh, is that uh, the aspect of freedom of religion and beliefs uh, is not an area that is readily inviting for women. But that has not prevented them from addressing issues at their own level on uh, freedom of religion and belief. Yeah? The fact that many religious uh, groups have male uh, leaders has not prevented them from creating their own space where they can bring about change. And by creating that space, they're able to work with people at the community, they're able to work with governments, yeah, and now they're aiming for, for the regional body. So that shows how we can harness uh, 
the, the, the power of, of, of women and women of all levels, those who have been to school, those who have not been to school, bringing people from different faiths together uh, is, uh, is a way to go for, for the women to help them deal with the issues. So now, going, you know, we've heard about how you were formed, uh, your structure, how you drew from uh, religious values. What issues do you grapple with in your context? Okay, thank you. Uh, in the name of Allah, I you all. I will talk of about 20 years back. I've been a peace activist for 20 years without being a woman of religion. We've been talking and talking, and the crime rate was ever increasing. The social norms were deteriorating. And I realized one thing. Peace and faith go hand in hand. Mm. If we want peace, we have to use the faith-based approach. And when I got involved with the women of faith four years ago, is when I'm seeing results. We were not talking now. We were preaching. And when you preach, you touch the heart, you touch the soul, you touch the mind of the person you're preaching to. We quote the, the verses from the Bible, we quote the verses from the Quran, and we are seeing results. There are so many challenges we have to adhere to. It was very hard for us to accept each other first because we've always been accusing each other. Mm. We've always been raising our voices against each other. And society to accept diverse cultures, diverse religions to work in one pot, that was a very, very big challenge for us. But we decided as women to soldier on because as women, our problems are all the same. If my child crosses over to go to Somalia, the same pain will affect the woman who's a Christian whose child has crossed over to go to Somalia. We needed to sit together and look for solutions. We are still going through the same challenges, but we are not giving up because now we've been accepted. We are now regional. We are not talking about the county. We are not talking about country. We are talking about regional and we are going global. Once we go, once we go global, even in regional, we'll have the capacity of attracting more people to help us overcome the challenges we are facing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, uh, Mama Shamsa, uh, for highlighting how uh, security issues became a reason for social cohesion for women of faith. So a good example of how we can make use of challenges and use challenges as opportunities yeah, to engage each other. So Nagiba, what are the issues in Uganda? What, what led to uh, the coming together of women of faith in Uganda? Are there similar issues to Kenya or are there different issues? Thank you so much. Um, maybe I'll just, let me talk a bit about the, the, the structures of the women of faith. Each country has got an interreligious council, and uh, it's, it depends on the country, the different religions that form it. So they have the council presidents, and those are the leaders from the religions that are forming it. And then they'll have the secretary generals of those religions forming the board. And then they have the women from those, uh, from the different religions forming the interreligious council and the youth being part of it. But that is loosely part of it. And they, don't, they don't form part of the board and all that. So my journey started, well, I had a community engagement for one year on prevention of HIV and parenting, positive parenting. And for the one year, the Muslims did not participate in those community engagements. So I took time and I went door to door to the Muslim homes asking them, why, why don't you come for these sessions? And they were not comfortable that it's an organization led by non-Muslims and an organization that's being funded by non-Muslims. And I was telling them, but it's HIV, it's not about religion. 
And in our community where we have polygamous, we, we have more issues. We should be more concerned, but they refuse to, to participate. So I opted out of the organization and offered to volunteer in the religious space, the Muslim community. I walked into the, the biggest mosque in, in Uganda, and I think it's the biggest, second biggest in Africa. I walked into there and I looked for the imam, requesting to have time with the women, because now I had an agenda of talking about health and education for the women. And to my surprise, it was like a whole government in there, and there was no woman. So they allowed me to volunteer, and I tried to see, well, how do I get to the women? They told me on Fridays when they come to the mosque, you will engage with them. In a sense, what happens to all the other women who can't come to this mosque? How do you get to them? And I requested to have contact persons, at least, from the different district, Muslim districts that make the Uganda Muslim Supreme Council. But my idea of going to mobilize the women so that they campaign for themselves and get their own leadership was flushed because the men are asking, what does she want to do that we're not doing? Who is she? Mm. She's speaking as who? <laughs> mm. So then I had to look at the constitution. The constitution had only the first article of the constitution saying all Muslim men and women are members of Uganda Muslim Supreme Council, not the girls. So I looked at who makes decisions in this space. So I found out the Secretary General, the Grand Mufti, those top leadership people can make the decisions. I started having the dialogues. And I requested to have contact persons at the district level, the county level, and the grassroots level. But I put a request still. The person they choose or nominate or elect, whatever process they will have, let that person be a lady who can read English, who can speak English, and you know, like who can write. Then there were some of them asked, other people who were around asked, why are you asking such things about education and all that? So, but I had an agenda because I know we go to school, but we're not recognized. And this is one step for us to be recognized. So I said, if I go to a place where I can't speak the language or even the dialect, then uh, I, they can speak, they can translate for their people. So I formed the, the women's desk and I was allowed to constitute, to mobilize the women and we formed uh, a women's structure alongside the men, even when we are not constitutionalized. And then I realized the Ghana Muslim Supreme Council is, formed, is part of interreligious council. But even at the functions of interreligious council, we were like get crushers at the functions. Mm. Everyone was recognized by name, they would stand up, and the women would never stand up, would never be recognized. So we started having those dialogues with the grand muftis, the archbishops, and one of my leaders is here, from the Orthodox, those are dialogues that started back then. And in 2013, they constitutionalized us. So we're in there, but we don't make decisions. But with the constitutionalization, then they changed some clauses and we get to sit on the board. I served on the board for six years with um, about 14 men. So you can imagine something that has to be done for the women and the vote it has to have against the others. And I had to find strategies of how do I get things on this table approved and implemented. So I started having a one-on-one -on -one with each person who sits on the board, way before they come for the board meeting. And it worked. But with that, I just need to recognize one of my leaders who those dialogues started with. Maybe it could stand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nagiba. And, and I think it is very important for us to hear about the story. Mm. Yeah? yeah. You know, we just see a network and we just think it happened. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know the personal sacrifices that people have made. And I think somebody, and I'm looking at you, Irene. 
These stories need to be told. <clears throat> These stories need to be documented of the sacrifices and commitment that uh, women of faith have shown to actually um, break the barriers, you know? And they're using the system to actually break the barriers. The verse that uh, Haile has shared, yeah, that talks about men and women being equal. And I saw uh, in the discussions, there are similar verses in all, all, all the different faiths, yeah. Uh, the constitutions of the organizations, yeah, that say men and women, you know, but yet men are not present. They are able to identify that and use that to penetrate, you know, and it is difficult. And I am saying it is difficult because I've been part of that journey for you to enter into spaces that is not normally accepted, you know, and, and be persistent for a very long time. And that is what these women have done in their in their respective uh uh, 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 context to actually deal with the issues. I'm now just going to highlight the issues that came up during the consultations. <clears throat> they have mentioned crime, they have mentioned uh, prevalence of gender based violence, gender uh, based and physical. Uh, based uh, violence, uh, with examples being given like uh, places in Nigeria where we have one in every four females uh, having experienced uh, one or another form of violence. That's, that's a really high number. And then we have uh, issues of uh, teenage pregnancy and child marriages um, that, of course, affects the literacy levels uh, for women. We have those issues in Uganda in Kenya and in Nigeria. Uh, we also have issues of uh, unequal economic uh, and political opportunities for women. Uh, we have heard of the hostile uh, political environment that is preventing women in Kenya from engaging in uh, elective politics. So they are dealing with social issues, they're dealing with political issues, uh, they're also dealing with um, economic uh, opportunities and creating them uh, for women. Um, there are also challenges of actualizing religious freedoms that are guaranteed in the, in the constitution. Uh, we have uh, religious practices that are linked to patriarchy that hinder the empowerment of women. And then we have lack of religious knowledge among women uh, that make it difficult for them to engage in re religious discourse. Yeah, For you to challenge the religious leaders, you need to go to them with religious sources. Like yesterday we had an issue or, or, or a discussion, a brief discussion about uh, women in Mombasa wanted to have a conversation about having a woman in the Kadi's court. And they were told, you should not even think about it. If I don't have the discussion, don't even think about it. Yeah. So um, I wish the women of faith, and this is a challenge to you, can now go to the next level. Initiate these discussions amongst yourself because it is a self space where you can talk, you can interrogate uh, the issues. So now we go to the next level before now we open um, to the audience to have a conversation with you. Please just share with us the things that you have been able to do. Things that you have, please, I will just allow you to share just one. I know there are many. In the interest of time, uh, please speak for only one minute. What are the issues that you've been able to do? You want to start, Nagiba? One minute. Okay, thank you. Um, where one of the best, uh, one of the big achievements we've had is having the women of faith in Uganda registered as a an entity, so that we manage our own resources, we manage everything. We're not rebels against the religious leaders. We want to be as women, do stuff as women. And then the other thing, we've engaged in policy formation in the country, in the different things, uh, the different bills, we've been engaged in that, and even at the regional level, where we engage with, um, we're taken on as co-facilitators or facilitators for peace and security for the women in uniform with East African community. And the last bit is the way we've, um, we participated in the National Action Plan for 1325 fully, and all our recommendations were taken on, and it was endorsed. But also, we've made a presence at uh, African level as women in the different regions, and we have also representation at the Global Women of Faith Network, where myself and Sister Agatha from Nigeria represent the African Women of Faith. And this was something that we had to work on 
Hard on. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Nakiba. Uh, my thoughts are rushing. I'm thinking on what to say. <laughs> but uh, women of faith, Mombasa, has been recognized. Uh, not even in Kenya, but uh, globally, due to the work it's doing on women empowerment. And uh, I thank Father Moutier. Congratulations for supporting us. and uh, giving, us, giving us a hand. We've partnered with different organizations. Kekoske is here. Thank you very much, Madam Phyllis. As women of faith, we've partnered with uh, the district peace committees in Mombasa where we've managed to reform 600 youths who were in criminal gangs. Mm. And Kekoske played a very big part in it. As uh, women of faith, we have crossed the barriers in Mombasa is a Muslim town. I can enter the church now without somebody raising eyebrows. I can take my friend who's a Christian, my sister who's a Christian into a mosque on Friday and we pray together with nobody raising eyebrows. We had our first launch yesterday in a mosque with Christians actually preparing for it in a mosque. That is, I don't know, I don't know what to say. What we have achieved in four years as faith leaders needs a book, an encyclopedia to be written. Needs an encyclopedia. What I can say is you need to hold our hands, especially the men out there. We are facing social factors, challenges, which is impeding our strength as women of faith to fight. We have the drug abuse. We don't have the money that the barons have. We have a problem in Mombasa, you mentioned it, on access to justice in the Kagel's court. Not necessarily being a woman Kagel. People should understand that a Kagel can be anybody. A woman, a Christian, provided you're qualified. But when there is no political goodwill and a politician of a very high caliber stands up, and say any woman who stands, stands out out there will see the hot bed if you try to mention or utter the word a woman Kali. We are doing it silently. My friend uh, and younger sister Ulfat Masibu was in Manzoni with several judicial officers and we will get there. We will get our place in the Kadi spot. It is not easy, but as women of faith, with the support we have, we will have our place in the Kadi spot. We are facing a lot of divorce cases. There are over 20,000 divorce cases in the Kadi spot. That's a big challenge to us. Women get divorced day and night. They marry in Facebook, they get divorced in Facebook, they get, give children in Facebook. So in South Thank Africa, you. we're just trying to find our feet. Uh, the the guidance of Ella Gandhi has been quite crucial in the, in the continuance of the women of faith um, efforts that we're trying to get underway. Um, Religious for Peace South Africa has been carried by women, um, and we've been bringing together religious leaders. So even though most of them are men, it's the women bringing them together. Um, so I'm quite proud of that. <coughs> And we are piloting a project called the Ubuntu Wellness Project, which is an effort of women of various faiths to, to create a space where women feel safe, where they can be together, where they can learn about one another, and also support vulnerable women um, using uh, both an economic model as well as the arts and, and support groups and programs like that. So that's our pilot project we're undergoing right now, which is quite exciting, but it's also a very, it's a baby. So please pray for us in South Africa. Africa. And um, it's it's really beautiful because in South Africa, one of our problems is that over 60% of our households are headed by um, women, grandmothers, young women, um, and they're carrying a lot of the load, oftentimes up to 10 children in a household, sometimes child-headed households. So our statistics are not good. But what I've observed in my 17 years as an honorary South African is uh, the strength 
of the women mm -hmm. to not only endure and survive, but to um, try and provide spiritual nourishment for their many children under their care. Um, the, the amount of women who church, attend church um, is quite high. We have um, in Durban, where I stay, we have a beautiful mix of Muslim, Hindu, Christian, and a few Baha'is, um, very peacefully living side by side, supporting each other's efforts. Um, during COVID, we came together um, to help with feeding schemes, to help with um, the rebuilding after the looting that happened in Durban. So we've had a really, really rough year. <laughs> um, but the unity that has been created through those hardships has been phenomenal. So it's through those tests and difficulties that we become very strong. So um, I've seen a lot of strength emerging out of the, 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 the flames <laughs> that are not dying down. Now we're rebuilding. Thank you. Uh, when God created the world, he created Adam and Eve. But somehow, through some cultural orientation or disorientation, women in Africa uh, have been forced, compelled to be uh, at the background, uh, not playing prominent roles. But the moment uh, our networks were able to prove that the creation of the woman was meant to be a help to the man and to the rest of society, we were able to demonstrate our relevance and the need for us to be consulted on all issues of national interest. And this is what has been happening you know, in many of our countries. For instance, in Nigeria, uh, international development partners look for us, you know, to deliver projects, particularly those projects uh, that, that have to be implemented at the community level, because they know we have the structures, they know we have the goodwill, they know we have also demonstrated capacity and competence. They also know that the communities listen to us. For instance, I remember in Nigeria, when we had problems uh, with Muslims accepting the polio uh, vaccine, it took our involvement and we had to go door to door. We, we have the structures, we are at local government level, we are at state level, and we have to go to the community level to go house to house. And once you introduce yourself and say, you're a member of former, ah, welcome. What have you got to tell us? And we explain, you know, uh, the issues surrounding uh, the vaccine. And that was how Nigeria now enlisted more uh, tolerance and acceptability of the uh, vaccine, uh, the polio vaccine until gradually, you know, we were able to kick out uh, polio from Nigeria. So that demonstrates one thing that women's organizations, our networks, you know, can do to uh, the benefit of, you know, to promote health amongst community people and also to ensure that government delivers on its mandate. We have been in democracy and governance. We have uh, been ob observers at uh, major elections in Nigeria. In fact, we've gotten to a stage that, you know, government, uh, uh, foreign partners, we say, no, look for this, look for Form 1, look for where we can. Because they have come to realize that, you know, we have a role to play. In, 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 in maintaining not just peace, but in also mobilizing families uh, to benefit from you know, uh, projects and to benefit from uh, government policies and programs. So that in itself is a, a, a way forward. When it comes to building peace, we have been 
instrumental, you know, to bringing together the diverse, to, to building on our diversity as women of faith, you know, and to use that as a strength. We keep on telling our members diversity is, is, is not a weakness. In fact, it is a strength because uh, from the religion, Islamic religious scripture, Allah uh, says, we have created you into tribes and nations so that you will know each other. So uh, being a Christian, being a Muslim, being belonging to any other religion, is not a cause. We have a lot to learn from each other. And now women are using this at the community level to talk to other women so that we learn you know, to live with each other, to be able to support each other, and to be able to even do projects <laughs> together. We demonstrated how what we can and form one in Nigeria empowered over 10,000 women this year through a project. The UN women felt, you know, we are the right people to do this project of reaching out to vulnerable uh, rural women, women who, who don't have contact with government. But the moment we moved into those communities, you know, who were accepted, who were able to train women as a community vanguard groups, you know, we are able to link them up with, with uh, government functionaries at the local government and at the state level. We are also able to encourage them to open accounts. Many of them <laughs> didn't know anything about opening of accounts, but they needed the accounts so that the money could be transferred to their accounts. So there's a lot that this network can do to bring about peace, security, uh, gender equity, and development, which, 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 which has um, you know, benefits for government and the citizens. Thank you very much, uh, Mama Halima. And I'd like to take this opportunity to, to say thank you to the gentlemen who actually accepted to partner uh, with the, with our with our sisters in our in achieving their goals, and we want to call for more uh, to come up from all faiths, yeah, from Muslims, Hindus, Baha'is, to all come together to support the agenda of women. And what uh, come, came out from them, and also uh, reading about uh, how engagement of faith groups in uh, peace building, in governance, in health and production issues before it was their platform being used, yeah? So UNICEF would come to you and say, we want you to popularize the vaccination campaign for us. But now it's different, yeah? They are setting the agenda. So even when somebody comes, whether it is um, UNICEF coming to Form 1 or coming to the Women of Faith Network in Mombasa, they have something to say, but we also have this. Yeah. So let us see how we can combine our efforts, merge our agenda to help the community. Yeah. And uh, as you can see from them, they are at different levels. Women of Faith was started at, at, the, uh, at the same time, but they are at different levels. And they are making strides. They have made a lot of strides in dealing with the issues of sexual and gender-based violence, but there's still a lot to be done. Yeah. Uh, and now I'm going to open the floor. Remember, I said it's going to be an inter interactive session. So anybody with uh, comments, anybody with questions, please let me know who you would like to uh, respond to your issue, including those who are virtual. Just uh, send a chat message and we will be able to direct the question or the comments to, to our different uh, amazing women. The floor is now open. Yes. Okay, thank you for such a nice presentation. My name is Mary Maina. I work for M94 Gold Point, Kenya. It's a pleasure to hear about women of faith from different countries. Interacting with them is enlightening us more. My question might be answered by Nagiba or Mama Halima, just to understand in terms of structural, uh, because we believe uh, there is a power in number. And how best can we ensure that we attract more to our structure? So in your country, you could kindly share 
Is it limited to members being drawn from the bodies which are formed under the, the religious council? And what, uh, what are deliberate measures you ensure that you have other women who are not part of those structures? Thank you. Take that one and then we'll go to the next question. Thank you. Um, like I shared earlier, uh, it's a religious councils at national level make their own decision to form the interreligious council. And the religions that form that interreligious council have their women and youth that come along. So at the national level, we will only have the coordinating committee, like for, for Uganda, they will have three women from each religion that forms the interreligious council, and then three youth also. Then the youth, the chairperson for the youth and chairperson for women will get a seat on the board. But uh, also for the board, apart from the secretary generals, it's a given for them to be on that board. They also nominate two people from their from their religion to come on the board. And now we've been pushing to have women to be part of those two people. And now this time around, we have more women on that. But down, we don't have a limit to the number. All the women that belong to that religion that forms the interreligious council are part of the women of faith. So you can imagine the numbers. Unless something touches someone's heart, mm. then he cannot act. Mm. Why do I say this? In 1979, my uncle lost his wife, and the wife died when she was giving birth. That was 1979, and I was still young. I became a priest. And when I went to the, uh, I was working with the mission, the hospital mission, and I got upset, whereby they were saying 25 women in Uganda die every day while giving birth. Mm -hmm. Then it took me back to 1979. Mm -hmm. I said, what should I do? It is like saying, don't lose all the bus in even Kenya. That bus full of people every day. Big crash, crashing like that. Every day. Mm. Then people started knowing what it means. For women to do what? To die every day. Then when the bishops met, and the, the sheikhs were there, I talked. I said, do you know what it means? 25 women dying every day. Mm. And we are here keeping quiet. Mm. And then when we come to discuss issues of women, no woman is around to mm. talk about that problem. And we decided for them, I said, we need to change. Mm. We need to invite these people. Let them also come here and talk about what, what is happening to them. It was not easy, but then they started coming. So much so, but slowly. I thank the women of faith for what you are doing, but it is just a drop in a notion. In Uganda, my sister there can, can, be, can testify. It is just recently that we allowed women also to participate in the monitoring and evaluation of what of elections. But you also come and be there. Because when we are affected, when we are having problems, it is you women and children who suffer God. Mm. And this is what is happening. However, there are some women whom we need to reach to, those who are still in the kind of in their tradition, uh, in the in their own African tradition. I'll give you an example. Those the Eastern, I will not mention them, maybe some of them might be here, who are still practicing genital mutilation. We go to them and say, what is the issue? Ah, Father, that is, don't go to that area. You talk to her, but then when you start touching her heart, 
and she feels it really, but they want that, uh, puts that tradition, the issue of tradition aside, then she comes to understand. And at least we are doing, we are doing a lot of work. But as long as you also leave the men behind, that one I have to tell you, you will not do much. Because when the woman, when you, when you leave the man, uh, is, some of you have seen on the social media, it is a clip which we usually say, a man can pregnant how many women in the nine months? A lot. But the woman can only get pregnant one, once in the nine months, that produce in nine months. But when they are making contraceptives, instead of giving them to men, who can pregnant a lot? <laughs> they give them the opposite to women. To the woman, and they are leaving the victim. Mm -hmm. You see? <laughs> so, it is true. Mm -hmm. Women, men can produce uh, every day. Mothers and Saturday is inclusive, but not men, but not women. Mm. So we need to bring them. And if possible, <laughs> with the leadership. Please approach us. When you, for instance, for me, when you tell me that the executive secretary of Uganda Joint Tradition Council, and I talk to the, the, the archbishops, those with the traditional religions, then I go to the sheikh. Believe me, what they will talk will go to the ground immediately. It will go to other bishops, then to the reverends, to the imams, and it trickles to the ground. Mm. Women of faith come to us. Look for people like us who can listen to you. Mm. And then who can also, you know, advocacy. Do that. So thank you. Mm. Mm. How, is this, how is your space with the issues of LGBT? Is that something that's being discussed? Is it something that is not, because uh, communities not yet ready to have a conversation around that? The community is not yet ready to have the conversation around it because it touches the matters of the heart. Although they are living within us, they are our sisters and brothers, but we have not yet accepted them to be in the in, uh, in religiously. They are with us outside, we eat with them, we laugh with them, we talk with them. When it comes to the matters of the heart, we have not accepted them in our networks. The matters of the heart is good because in our uh, Quran, in our Bibles, they are being termed as the cast ones. Yeah. That is the truth of the matter. Okay. In Uganda, the uh, constitution does not uh, give them that freedom, the LGBTI. And I remember we had an incident where the interreligious council said also they're not giving them that space. But the reality is they're among us. We have them as children, we have them as siblings, we have them as maybe partners, they're in our community, but, and they'll get all the services that they are, we, they are, uh, that are available. But right now in, the, in those spaces, in the structure, they could be there, but they've not declared, yeah, because of uh, what the country is saying or what the religious books are saying. But we don't have them like this is a well-known person who has declared, who has disclosed, but we know that they're there. Because when you, sometimes you're doing psychosocial support, you, you get to engage with some of them either in the schools, directly in the schools or in the community or families. But it's not that... Um, it has not come out like we have any on board. If they are there, they've not disclosed. Yeah. I just wanted to affirm uh, all the women here and the work that you are doing. And also to say, uh, in terms of the, I wasn't even going to uh, raise the LGTBI, but we have a program where we have religious leaders uh, engaging with LGTBI people sitting around like here. Uh, simply because we realize that religious texts that were used against women are similar to religious texts that are used against LGBTI. So we see a similar pattern that religious texts are used to marginalize groups. 
If they marginalize women, they marginalize black people, they enslave black people, and now they are marginalizing uh, LGBTI people through stories like Sodom and Gomorrah. But when we reread, just as women, we reread the scriptures for our liberation. So we are rereading the scriptures for the dignity of LGBTI people and even people with disabilities. They've also been marginalized using the scriptures. So they are rereading the scriptures and coming up with concepts like God is disabled because we are made in the image of, of God. So, 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 so I think we need to start off by saying that uh, our scriptures are not neutral. They've been read in ways that they marginalize every single group. And so if we as women found our liberation, so why can't LGTBI people also find their liberation from the same scriptures? Uh, thank you. When I sit here, I don't sit here as Mama Chamsa. I sit here representing almost 10 religious, RCB, religious uh, bodies. Traditionally, the, the traditional healers who visit the caves inclusive. We have SDA, we have OAIC, we have EAK, we have KCCB, we have NCCK, we have NAMLEF, we have SUKEM, and uh, Isna Shari are also there and the traditional healers. They're almost 10. So now when I sit here, I don't see Mama Shamsa, see the chair of all, I'm the anointing one. So the traditional healer doesn't have to be here in person. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I've made myself clear and I'll leave the interface for you. My sister may give to reply. Thank you. And uh, maybe that's just for Kenya, that, but uh, the African Council of Religious Leaders has all these religious groups on board and the traditional relig African religion. So that is covered for whoever, whichever country that is having them on board, they're on board for African Council of so Religious Leaders, African Women of Faith Network. And to sign up, um, we have a very, very powerful youth network of faith. And we'll introduce you to some of them and you engage with them. And most of them, some of them are here also. And as youth and technology, they just make us move faster. Mm -hmm. We're just trying not to tag along with that, but I know we'll get there. Okay. Thank you. And friends, I think as women of faith, one thing that is at the core of everything we do is to remember the golden rule, which is the same across all faiths, which is we should we prefer others to ourselves, we should do it to others as we would have done it to us. And I think uh, irregardless of the small details of all of the, the scriptures that may conflict with specific beliefs, our job as women of faith is to create spaces for marginalized people, for youth, for um, the indigenous population to feel that they have a home, that they're accepted and loved. Um, and, you know, in my experience in South Africa, which is a very liberal uh, community, uh, we, we have to be very sensitive to this and make sure nobody feels ex excluded. So I just wanted to say that um, as a woman of faith, and I think my sisters will agree with me, is that our hope is that any youth, any person with a different sexuality can feel they can come and say a prayer with us if they need help or if they need a resource, that they know that they can come to us. Um, so I just, I think you, sh you share my, my sentiment on that, that um, women of faith have to be that resource for the community because we are the mothers. You know, we are mothers to humanity. And humanity is very diverse. <laughs> So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. So now we are coming towards the end and I'm going to ask the women for a parting shot. One thing that you'd like these people to go with. One thing. I would want this audience and um, even beyond to go with the fact that men and women are partners in development. They are created you know, for that purpose. And as faith leaders, uh, women have their constituency, men have their constituency, but we believe there are uh, uh, areas of uh, serious collaboration, uh, interfaith, and between men and women particularly. 
uh, when women talk of marginalization uh, and the rest of it, what I keep on saying is, look, uh, watch what must be equity. Yes, the man, for instance, cannot carry pregnancy for nine months because he was not created for that. We must recognize those differences. I, as a woman, may not have the brute force of the man to do, to do farming, to do certain things, physical labor. But in our creation, God, Allah, has not made the woman inferior. She's a partner. And let's work with each other, you know, uh, promoting that concept. Uh, two, we also need to do uh, a lot of training at the family level, at the community level, on positive masculinity. Yes, we are bringing up our boys uh, as if uh, uh, they are the most superior human beings and that they are to lord it over, 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 over the, the women or the girls. Boys must be brought up to be protective of women, to see women as, you know, partners in progress. Thank you. Okay, so mine is a challenge um, for all of our, our brothers in the room on Zoom as well. My challenge is to when you see spaces where women are quiet and their voices are not being, being heard as equally as the men in the room, to have the bravery to say, I'd love to hear the gentleman. I'd love to hear what my sister has to say. Can we have a, a moment? There is so much power in that statement for men to say, I'd love to hear what my sister has to say. So my challenge is to, to find those spaces and to make those spaces. Make room for the women. Um, also, I would like to challenge our, our, our brothers to encourage our boys to assist with health, household work, to assist with um, everything from cooking to helping change the nappies of the baby in the house. Let us carry the babies on our back as well. Let the men do that as well. Let, let men see that that's okay. So that's my challenge to the men. And my challenge to the, 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 the lovely sisters in the room is to know deep in your heart that you have so much power and to find your voice and to use that voice. Um, I remember my first trip to Africa. I was a young girl. I was in the village. I must have been about 18. And I was um, deep in the village and um, there was an event in the evening and they asked me to speak. And it was only men attending because the women were at home caring for the children. So here is this young woman <laughs> And all these men in the village. And then they asked me to tell a story. And then I was telling a story of, about a very powerful woman. And as I spoke of my power, I looked at these men and I saw in their eyes a level of respect for me. So when women find their power, it, it commands respect. So find your voice. Don't be afraid to use your voice. And, and you will find that and men start to come to the party. When you are too quiet and you're, 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 you keep yourself low, you will be treated more likely in that way. So put your shoulders back and use your voice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The way we constitute uh, our messages to the public has evolved with time. Our children spend 70% uh, of their time on media. They look, look at look these at messages, messages on media. They refer to these messages on media. We have so many fake uh, religious leaders on media. That's why we have a lot of misconceptions. This is a challenge to us as faith leaders. How are we countering these messages on media so that our youths don't get lost? Thank you. To, to close your eyes just for a few seconds. We're not going to pray, but I invite you to close your eyes just for a few seconds and think about the women in your life. 
right from home. Your siblings, your wife, your sisters, the mother, aunties, your neighbors, uh, women at your workplace, and all the different places, the places of worship in the community, where you pass to go to work and all the other places. Have you tried reaching out? Let's work together as partners. Let's allow us fly together with you. <coughs> Thank you. It has been an inspiring session. It has been a session that has called for research and evidence-based advocacy and lobbying. So let us move forward. Let's move that agenda forward together. And to you, women, uh, Nigerians say what? More grease to your elbow. Yes. More grease to your elbow for you to do what you're doing and uh, to make advancement in, um, in the agenda for ensuring that we have gender equity and freedom of religions and beliefs for all. What I've learned is that issues and problems are vast. Um, listening to what's happening in Nigeria, listening to what's happening in Kenya, um, hearing about the challenges throughout Africa, it's vast and it's overwhelming. However, it's also heartening to see how much work is being done to combat gender-based violence, to help our girls, to um, you know, address the issues. So with all of the difficulties, nobody's sitting around doing nothing. I'm listening to these faith leaders talk and the work they are doing is phenomenal. So we must really praise one another and encourage one another and not be feeling hopeless because as long as people are serving and working, there's always a solution. And, and even if it takes a while, if we work together, that, that time is not going to take quite as much time. It won't take as, quite as much time. Yeah. <laughs>